my friends, this is Deepak Chopra. My great delight today to speak with Erez Safar and this beautiful book that he has uh, written, Light of the Infinite, The Exodus of Darkness. I love the title and especially the, the subtitle. I have read uh, your previous book. I don't have it here. That's how we got uh, connected. So first, yeah. congratulations. And uh, I think our audience would love to know a little bit about your life. You're obviously well known in your own ecosystem, but uh, <laughs> let's see uh, what you can tell us a little bit about your life. Uh, I'm, I read your life here. <laughs> yeah, in the introduction you up, your the father first was, one. <laughs> yeah. Sure. But uh, let's, let's uh, go over it a little bit. Sure. So I can start previous to writing the books. Uh, I started, I guess the first jump into the creative space was through music. And I had actually gone to, my dad was a rabbi in the Navy. So we traveled. Uh, I was born in San Diego. A month later, we moved to Japan and then Charleston in Italy. And he was a conservative rabbi who went to the JTS that was partnered with Columbia University. And he learned with Avram Joshua Heschel who I think, you know, I sent you that post with Martin Luther King yeah. on, um, on that day. And he's just massive inspiration. And basically my dad wanted to raise us when, when he could put us in environments where there was Torah learning, Jewish learning, kosher food. So obviously that wasn't always, we weren't always able to do that. But um, in the instances when, when we could, then I was sort of surrounded in this community and got a sense of like living through Torah and like, in the cycle of the Jewish cycle and how that revolves around reading the Torah and all that. So music actually jumped in because I went to, when we were living in Maryland where he retired, I went to yeshiva. So the first half of the day is learning the Talmud, the oral Torah and all the different teachings as well as the written Torah. And I actually got kicked out of all the Jewish schools, three schools, I think, um, freshman year. So I ended up going to a non-Jewish school and it ended four hours earlier than the Jewish school. So I just had all this extra time and I bought like a four track drum set, guitar, keyboard and all this. And I just started composing songs, just me playing all of the parts. And that's kind of when I fell in love with just creation and tapping into, you know, just seeing how you can write and create music and how it flows to you from this space that you don't understand at that age, you know? Um, and this book series was really, unfortunately, inspired by my ex-wife, mom. When she passed away, it was a yard site, which is like the commemoration of a loss. So it was a year after she passed. And I wrote what would become the first chapter of this book. And at the time, I never thought I would write like Torah or Jewish mysticism or Kabbalah type of writing, you know? So it was also just opening myself to this possibility where it's like, I never thought that that would happen, but it did. And then unfortunately my mom passed away shortly after. And that was when I devoted myself to learning and continuously staying in this space where I can hopefully learn things that this ancient Jewish mysticism and this wisdom that I could bring to other people that are in constant states of, you know, disconnect and sometimes depression. Um, and that was really what inspired the series. And it just kept flowing. From there basically so you know i've read both your books by now and i'm a student actually of uh, both jewish mysticism and its connection to other forms of mysticism which i'll talk about in a bit but for those uh, who are not uh, you know familiar with jewish mysticism uh, I know this book will make total sense to anyone in the Jewish community or the Hasidic community or you know, the mystical uh, aspects of Judaism. But those who are outside that, uh, what can they expect to learn from your books and how can they benefit? Sure. So, I mean, one of the, one of the things that resonated with me the most and was kind of a turning point when I'm reading, you know, with Judaism, you're reading the different portions of the Torah every week, right? So it's split amongst the weeks. So you're sort of existing in these energies and these stories. And, you know, depending how you grew up, most people are reading these 
as his, maybe historical, but just these stories that happen at one point and we're supposed to learn something through them. But the Kabbalistic approach really is that these stories are happening at all times. And the Baal Shem Tov, he's the Hasidic master actually, the, the one that inspired all the different branches of Hasidut came from the Baal Shem Tov. And when Purim is kind of our Halloween, you know, it's the, it's now focus. So we're like flipping everything. It's actually this space in Kabbalistic terms, it's the 50th gate. It's the space of full wisdom of all, everything is all good. There's no separations in that space. It's the redemptive state. So Purim is kind of this story in this holiday where you're going into that space, but it's, you, so there's a custom to like drink and it's be merry, but it's also to reach this space where there's no differentiation and it's like beyond wisdom, right? So also when we read the Megillah, it's this story of Queen Esther and people know this story, but the halakha, the law is that somebody who reads it backwards, they haven't fulfilled the obligation to read it. So the Baal Shem Tov says, it's not literally reading it backwards. It's reading this story as if it happened long ago, as opposed to that it's happening currently right now in your life. And with Passover, it's the same thing. Mitzrayim is Hebrew for Egypt. And the root is Mitzar, which is constriction, this narrowness, this constricted space. And Pharaoh represents the king of the constriction, right? And Pera, like a, an, a, a mouth that is bringing about disconnect and constriction. And Pesach is an open mouth, which is how we speak the redemptive state into into being. So me trying Egypt in all of these stories, it keeps recurring. It's this space that we're trying to leave all the time and to sort of push away these layers of disconnect, these enslavements that we place on ourselves, whether it's doubt that keeps us constricted or fears that keeps us away from all the things that we want to do. And then we're trying to continuously leave Egypt and go to the promised land, to Israel, which represents the redemptive state. So it's really just this other way of looking at the story as Esau or Esau and Yaakov or Jacob, that there are two sides. There's the sort of evil inclination that does have a godly spark within it, but represents the side that opposes the sides of godliness. And then there's Yaakov, who is representing the godly spark within all of us and the good inclination. And so we're not reading it as these people that, okay, this person's evil and this person's good. And that's how we're supposed to read it. It's, it's actually, they exist within us. And we're trying to connect to the, to the good and to use the, if you want to say evil, whatever, the bad inclination, use that as a tool to bring about more goodness. Because that's the one that has the cough, that has the strength to do things in this physical space. And if we use that to elevate to the spiritual space, then we can connect to the redemptive state continuously. So all these stories that we read about in the Torah and the Bible, uh, they're basically archetypal symbols of states of consciousness in our own self. Is that exactly? Good? Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's the way quicker, <laughs> the simpler way to put it. Yeah, but I yes, I think that's what Hasidic thought and Kabbalah brings. Whereas if you would read it literally and don't have these different tools to unpack it at all times, then you wouldn't really get that necessarily. Correct. So, you know, I've been looking at uh, some of the diagrams in your book, The Tree of Life, etc. And a while back, I created my own, uh, um, my own chart. And here it is. Nice. Judaic uh, tr uh, cognition, as I call it and uh, uh, comparing it with uh, some of the thoughts in Buddhist and uh, Vedantic traditions. So I put together this chart and I'd, I'm very keen to speak to you to see if, um, if you think there might be some, uh, some correlation. Okay, so shall, may I Please, go yeah. start with you? Yeah, I'd love it. Okay, so, you know, uh, first you have the realm of reality, the universal domain which uh, is called Ein Sof. And yeah. in, um, in uh, Buddhism or Vedanta, that's called Brahman, but it's the same, you know, it's the infinite light of awareness. And then from there, the differentiation starts and you have 
the realm of archetypes, angels, higher beings, <clears throat> which uh, in the Kabbalistic tradition we call Atsilut. <clears throat> Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yep. Yeah, <clears throat> emanation. Yeah. Emanation. And that's called Atman Theosphere in the Eastern wisdom traditions. Uh, you have uh, Beria, the subtle body. Correct? Correct pronunciation? Mm -hmm. Bria, yeah, yeah, creation, thought and, and intellect, yes. And that would be the noosphere, you know, the, from the theosphere coming to the mental body, so to speak. And then the realm of emotions, yet sira, which uh, yeah. is also part of the mind. And then the physical domain, realm of time, space, and causality, which uh, you call asiya, correct? Asiya? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. And that's the biosphere. And then, you know, as we go a little deeper into Beria, Chokma, Bina, Diyat, the creative impulse, the nurturing impulse, the integrating impulse, and then uh, even beyond that, intellect, creativity, ego identity, there seems to be actually a lot of correspondence. So, you know, I went into a little bit of historical, um, etymological, um, a exploration of these names. So, you know, uh, the archetypes like Hesad, Avraham, which is Abraham, giving and receiving, mm -hmm. Gebra, Isaac, restraint, Tiferet, yeah. Jacob, integrates, Netzach, Moses, reaching out, Hod, Aaron, empathetic listening, Yeshod, Joseph, bonding, Malchut, Shekhinah, spontaneous right action. Yeah, are these pretty? Yeah, actually, I'm printed out but, right here. Yeah, so and yeah, spot on. Yeah. How weird is that? That that the exact same concepts are there in the wisdom traditions of the East, and you know, there's a lot of literature on the lost tribes of uh, Israel. How many tribes were there? How many tribes are there? So, I mean, the, so the idea is, as you're talking about Abraham and Chesed, loving kindness, and there's thought to be, there was imbalance there, and that's why there's Yitzchak and Ishmael. And then there's Yitzchak, as you said, that represents um, Gevura, restraint, judgment, and then there's an imbalance of that, so that there was Yaakov and Esau. And then Yaakov, he is the Tiferet, the harmony, and because he had perfected those imbalances. And then through him comes the tribes because that was like this sort of perfected Tiferet harmonious stage. So there's the 12 tribes and then, yeah, there's lost tribes. And the reason why I think there's so many correlations is because these thoughts and ideas are coming from Abraham and the, all the Abrahamic faiths and all the different sort of thoughts and different religions and modes of thinking are coming from the exact same space. So it does make sense that, of course, there's all those correlations. And, you know, the reason why actually the whole story of Yosef, of Joseph, and why his brothers sold him into slavery and why they're sort of against him was actually because they thought that he was the continuation of that imbalance where there's going to be Abraham and then Yishmael and Yitzchak, and then Yitzchak and then Esau and Yaakov. So they thought it continued with Yosef, but he was actually a continuation of Yaakov who already had perfected that state. In India, we use the word Yahudi <laughs> frequently uh, to refer to um, Jews. And, you know, India has a tradition of Jews going back uh, a long time. <clears throat> There's a town in Kerala called Jewtown in uh, Cochin. And uh, people refer to them as Yahudis. There's also the Jewish tradition in Calcutta, Bengal, <clears throat> that goes back a few thousand years. And, uh, you know, in the Indian mythology, Krishna, who is, uh, you know, the most important or one of the most important avatars or incarnations of God, is frequently referred to as a Yehudi, that he was one of the um, you know, incarnations on planet Earth of one of the lost tribes of Israel. Do you know anything about that? Or uh, 
I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know about that. I know the more modern, like Ram Das and some of the other ones that are like Jews that, you know, rename themselves well, yeah. um, and go into that. But yeah, I don't know that much about what you're speaking in terms of, you know, the history of that. I haven't really heard that, but that's super interesting. Yeah, it's very. And then, you know, I was looking at some parallel concepts, Gilgul Hanafesh, the cyclic reincarnation of wandering soul, Tulku. Is that yeah. of your tradition? Yeah, reincarnation, souls, and coming back to rectify through Tikkun. Yeah, 100%. There's the word Ram, elevated being, which is also the name of an avatar in India, Ram. Ashurim, which is the word which is in Sanskrit, ashram, which means spiritual wealth. I find these. Oh, interesting, because Ashi, yeah, Ashirim is yeah, is wealth and more, yeah, biblical Tam, and modern. Tame, spiritual inertia. <laughs> wow. Every other side of the Euphrates, Hindu other side of the Indus, same thing. <laughs> they are knowledge, which in uh, in India is called Veda. It's just the same sound. They are Veda. Shekhina, Shakti, same sound, and then Halal, the infinite void, Shunyata, Olamat, parallel worlds, Lokas, Rua, spiritual energy, Prana. I find this astonishing that there is such correlation. So, which means that the origin of this knowledge, which is obviously divine, is universal. Yeah, hundred percent. I was actually learning yesterday. It was super interesting in Nukute Nukute Maran, which is Rabbi Nachman, one of my favorite rabbis. Who actually this jacket I designed just says his name and his main student, Rabbi Nathan. But he was highlighting that when we say the Totafot in the Shema, you know where we like cover our eyes and say Shema Yisrael, that God is one. You heard that prayer? Yes. Um, yeah. So in that, where we talk about the tefillin that we wear. It says totafot, and he was highlighting that, you know, that's not actually Hebrew. It's, it's made of two different languages. Tot, meaning two in Coptic, and fot, or pat, meaning two in Afriki. And it's really to learn that we learn that we separate, there's four, four separations in the tefillin that we wear, and then there's the parchment. And we learn that from those two different languages to highlight the, the godly spark and the godly teachings that are in all the different languages and all the different religions. So it was kind of a cool teaching that I read, I think yesterday, and I was like, oh my God, I never, because it's not a Hebrew word, but sometimes you don't really think what the origin is, what the origin is and then you de dive deeper into the purpose of that, of using that. So, so Eris, uh, you know, I read your book, I read your previous book, there's so much, uh, beautiful knowledge it's so practical the mystical traditions all say the same thing that fu fundamental reality is infinite it's beyond space time that we get in touch with it we have the emergence of what we call platonic truths beauty harmony love compassion joy equanimity and ultimately the loss of the fear of death which is the essential religious experience and it's common to all. So given that, and given this profound knowledge, how come thousands of years later today, we're still kind of fighting with each other. <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're kind of you know, yeah, right? rushing to extinction with climate change and war and terrorism, <laughs> mechanized death and poison in the food chain. What, what, what do you think? is ultimately the solution or is there a solution because the reality is one it's just yeah. used different words even the words are similar actually you can't even uh, if you go to the etymology of the word they have the same sound the same origin why are we so insane given this precious wisdom that comes directly from the divine right so there <laughs> yeah i think about this a lot um, there's this teaching that, that we get touched almost by an angel, this marking on our lip, that we get taught all of these teachings that you've just spoken about. And then right when we're about to get born, we sort of like lose it all. And I guess that's in a way to maintain 
free will because if we knew all of these things, then we would be just angels and we wouldn't be in this space to rectify this, the separations and all this sorts of stuff. But I think, you know, when each person's born, they have to figure this out for themselves. And I think now in this generation, for sure, and as we saw even in previous ones, it takes so long for people to reach that because physicality separates us. It's the soul that unites us, right? So when we're born, we're not jumping right into wisdom of spirituality and the soul from ourselves, but it is there. We have to, um, you know, if we can take off those layers and everything, we can, we can get there. But I think because we're all on such different timelines, <laughs> a lot of people are just separated by physicality and all of the things that they're focusing on all the things that separates us. And it creates all this animosity and fear of the other, as opposed to love of the thing that unites us. But yeah, I mean, I, I really, of course, don't have the answer for it, but it's one, one more, it basically in, in Judaism, in Kabbalah, it's called klipa, right? So that's the shell that's covering the godly awareness. And in your book, the, seven spiritual laws of success. I remember you talk about, you know, the divinity and success and happiness being the awareness of divinity, right? And Likutei Mara, and that's what Rabbi Nachman also opens up on his Torah, like you have to see the Secha, the sort of the intellect, but also it's consciousness and awareness, the, God, the godly spark within every single thing. And if we were all able to do that, if it wasn't concealed, then of course, yeah, we would all realize that we're all one and we can live in harmony. But there's all these garments. The less spiritual you are, the more klipot, the more garments conceal our connection, our unity, our oneness in God. The more spiritual and the more wisdom and the more you practice that are and become one, then you could actually, then you start these, these, these garments, these livushim, they're called in Hebrew, they start to peel away. And there's actually this story it's an amazing story. The Rebbe Marash, he's the fourth Hasidic master after the Baal Shem Tov in the Chabad Hasidic tradition. And one of his followers, one of his Hasidim comes to him and he's, you know, he has an inn. This was hundreds of years ago. And he was like really worried because he's about to lose everything. And it just, nobody's coming. It wasn't doing well. And he's asking him what he should do. And the Rebbe Marash, he, he tells him, go to your inn, prepare as if you're going to have a hundred guests get all the rooms ready, cook all the food, make it as if you're going to have a hundred guests. And he's thinking like, this is the ultimate test of faith because if I do this and it doesn't work out, then for sure he's out hundred percent, you know, but he's like, I have to follow the words. There's obviously something here and I have to tap into the faith and sort of manifest it. So he does exactly that. And right before Shabbat, right before the Sabbath, this a group of people they're coming and they're lost and they don't know what to do and they need to be somewhere for Shabbat and someone brings them to him and he's like this is perfect I actually I'm totally set up and whatever everything sort of works out thank God so he comes to the Rebbe Marash and he says how did you know like I don't understand how did you know that this was going to happen and the Rebbe Marash looks at him and he says when you're on a higher level you can see further and he's not speaking in, from a space of arrogance. He's speaking from when you're tapped more into the godly space and know that we're God's children and we're always going to be provided for. And when we're like unify ourselves with that, we can manifest it and bring it into our lives. And Rabbi Nachman says the blessings are always coming down. It's like Shefa, right? It's like rain. And it's our vessel that we have to perfect because if we're not perfected and we're not aligned with it, the blessings can come, but just like water coming into a vessel, it could just leave. And we can't hold on to it. But the more we're aligned with the spiritual side and not the physical, then we could actually hold on to those blessings. My very special guest has been uh, Erez Safar, the book uh, series called Light of the Infinite, The Exodus of Darkness. I love the subtitle as well. So um, you're a rabbi, right? I'm not a rabbi. I'm a rabbi's son. Yeah, but yeah. The, you, know, you have the wisdom of a rabbi, and <laughs> the, the, the book talks also in great detail about various meditations and various rituals and various kinds of prayers. So congratulations on the book <clears throat> and your you. amazing career, and I hope people will read this book, not only in the 
to Jewish community, but outside of it, because we have so much to learn from this great tradition of wisdom. I am very grateful for this conversation. And uh, before I let you go, I want to ask you a couple of things which may not be relevant at all to the book. But sure. what's in that cart right beside yourself? <laughs> yeah, so this, so I had an art gallery for six years, um, Bain's Gallery and Gallery 38. So this cart is just full of spray cans and in, in old school TV. Um, I was going to set up on the other side where it's more of like my music studio, but it was a bit busy. So I set up over here that just has minimally placed uh, things, objects. But yeah, that's more of my art background. And any special significant significance to that painting behind you? Oh, the Marc Chagall? Oh, that's a Chagall. So, that's right. Yeah, so I actually, I have a lithograph in the hallway, a bigger one with Moses and the tablets that I love. And I got after my mom passed because Chagall was our favorite artist. So it was kind of like, a, you know, that we'd finally have this thing together in a sense. Um, but yeah, Chagall is just one of my one of my favorite artists. So it's it's all well, kind of like a tribute to him. I'm looking at a very artistic scene and that includes you as part of the art <laughs> and your cap and everything else. Um, my very special guest once again has been Erez Safar based out of the stereophonic heart of Los Angeles. He's an award-winning producer, best-selling author of Light of the Infinite, Creative Machine, and Gallerist. Please pick up this book and get a little enlightenment. Thank you very much for joining me, Iris. Thank you so much. Massive honor. Mm -hmm.